Good evening, everyone. Welcome. On behalf of all of us at the Rogers Memorial Library, we are delighted to have each of you this evening. And we are particularly delighted to have a guest who will be speaking about the maritime aspects of the international economic order. And who best to talk about this subject than our guest, uh, retired Admiral Jim Burton is. Uh, I want to thank the Denny's who are uh, sitting over there, uh, Sean and Elizabeth, for pointing out the fact that, that he would be in this village this particular week for a very happy reason, and that is that, the, that um, their daughter, Kelly, who's seated here, will be marrying uh, the burden is his son, Eke, who's also here, uh, this Sunday. So it was a happy occasion. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our guest. Admiral Jan Gordonis graduated from the Turkish Naval Academy in 1979. As a deck officer, he served on various destroyers and frigates and assumed the command of the guided missile frigate TCG Gaziantep in 1998 and the 3rd Destroyer Division in 2002. He completed his education in the Turkish Naval War College and the Armed Forces College in 1989 and 2002, respectively. He holds two degrees from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School and the Université Libre Brussels in Personnel Management and International Politics. Um, Admiral Gudiniz was pr promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral the lower half in 2004 and then the upper half in 2008. He served as the chief of the strategy department and then the head of plans and policy division in the Turkish Naval Forces headquarters. As part of his flag officer combat duties, he has also served as a commander of the amphibious ships group and the mine fleet between 2007 and 2009. In 2012, he retired and founded the Istanbul Coach Maritime Forum, University Maritime Forum in 2015. And he stir still serves as the director of Maritime Forum and is a regular writer for newspapers and magazines on maritime issues. And is also the author of eight books related to maritime strategy, history, and culture. It is a great honor to have him here. Please welcome. Thank you very much, and for the introduction. It's great pleasure and privilege for me to be with you here because, as she explained, uh, with one stone we have two birds. <laughs> and I, I'm going to have maybe the happiest moments of my life. Uh, my son will marry, and so with this opportunity, uh, thanks for the invitation once again, and it's great to. Uh, talk about the, what we will see in maritime domain in the 21st century. Before I commence my lecture, I'm going to say something. That 21st century will be the century of oceans and the seas. There is no doubt for it. Never been before the oceans and the seas were that important. And I'm going to explain why. World population increases one billion every 15 years. 250 birds per minute versus 115 deaths per minute. And in 1970, the world population was 3.7. And right now, 7.5. By 2030, it's going to be 8.4 billion. So that, of course, affects the GRPs and the share of the uh, world economic order. Uh, as you see in this slide, in 2016, the uh, USA had the 24% share and China 15% share, but we know that in 2030 it's going to change. And the many emerging markets and emerging countries also have been affecting this uh, situation. And it's expected in 2030 that the $200 trillion will be the world GMP. In Asia, 
every minute, 265 people that have entered the middle, every minute. By 2030, Asian buying power is to increase eightfold. Why that happened? Because in 1995, India became the World Trade Organization member, and China in 2001. And 2.4 billion new middle class added to the world economic order in the last 20 years. Which means more energy, more food, more transportation, and more consumers, more and more, everything. That affects, of course, world economic order, trade, and production, two main pillars. And this is important in terms of energy and the transportation because for the production you need the energy for the trade you need the transportation or shipping maritime trade everything we are consuming or we are using in this new uh, world order economic order 85 percent shipped over the seas for Turkey, for instance, our export and imports are done 85% via the maritime shipping by these ships. So, transportation and shipping is indispensable for food security and energy security. If we didn't have the merchant fleets, half of the world population will die either of hunger or cold. So we need ships. So 50,000 merchant ships registered over the 150 states carry 11.3 billion tons of cargo in last year. So for Turkey, I said 85%. I will say for the world, 90% of the world trade, global trade. We are talking about 20,000 ports worldwide. Again, registered in more than 150 nations. And our dependence on the shipping tripled in the last 40 years. Why? In 1973, when I was in Naval High School, 3.5 billion tons carried over the oceans. But last year, 11.3 billion. And 2030, expected to reach 25 billion tons. It's a huge growth. Last year, only in the South China Sea, five trillion dollars value of goods were transported. If you consider the last year, the general value of the all goods carried over the sea about 20 billion, uh, to, uh, 20, sorry, uh, 17 trillion dollars. World trade, I will say almost one third carried over the South China Sea. So that affects all, of course, the merchant fleet. In 1992, the merchant fleet was 621 million dead weight ton, which uh, is the capability of a ship carrying the cargo. And 2017, that reached three times more, 1.8 billion that great ton. And guess who enlarged most container fleet? Eight folds, LNG fleet, five folds. For instance, United States LNG fleet, liquefied natural gas fleet, you know, growing very fast. Why? Because of shale gas and because of exporting the American LNG to the worldwide and therefore your LNG fleet is growing day by day. But container fleet, we are talking about container fleet, we can talk about China. Because container revolution took place in their domain. Look at 1992, 283 million tons carried via the containers. 2017, 1.8 billion tons. And 2030, it's expected almost 3 billion tons. And in terms of the boxes, 
these are the tombs. In terms of the boxes that you see in everyday life, in Istanbul we can see everyday containers going, coming and going out. 692 million TEU, which is the 20 foot equivalent unit boxes, 20 foot. Uh, of which, this is worldwide figure, one term handled in Chinese ports. There are 50 mega ports in worldwide. The top 10 is US, Europe, and China. But within the top 10, the top six in China. So look at their numbers. 2010, it was 140 million bucks handled in China. In 2013, expected 620 million of interest. In Turkey last year, they handled only 11 million TU or bucks. So huge numbers we are talking about. The ship you're seeing on the screen can carry 18,000 boxes. 18,000. Imagine that if they offload 18,000 uh, boxes in the port for Turkey, I would say there was a line from Istanbul to Ankara. <laughs> okay. Pipelines. Why pipelines? Because I would like to give you an idea what is the role of pipeline versus tankers or shipping to carry energy, hydrocarbons. 95% of natural gas carried over the pipeline versus 35% of crude oil, which means 65% of crude oil carried by the ships. Let's look at the daily tons. In 1992, it was 4.6 million tons, 17, 8.2 million tons, but in 2030, it's going to be 15 million tons. Any day, 15 million tons is on, on the move over the blue waters. We are dependent on oil and gas, hydrocarbons, and it will be like this, maybe the next hundred years, maybe more, even though renewable energy is uh, on high growth, but uh, the place of hydrocarbons will not change so easily. This is very unfortunate, but it, it is a reality. We spent 4 billion tons in 2010 oil, 4.3 in 2016, and it expected to rise in 2030 to 6.4 billion tons. For the natural gas, it was 2.7 billion tons of oil equivalent. In 2016, 3.2, and 2030, 5.4 billion tons of oil equivalent. For the sea, I told you that the 21st century century to sea, not for only for shipping, but also for oil and gas and other resources extraction. In 2017, half of the natural gas we used in our homes were extracted from the seabed. And 30% of the crude oil was extra extracted from the seabed. Too. But in 2030, both will be 50%, maybe more, extracted, will be extracted from the sea. Look at the numbers of platforms, offshore rigs for hydrocarbons. In 2010, worldwide, there were 270 platforms. In 2030, it's going to reach 618. So 2030, we expect a 2.6 billion ton crude oil and 1.8 billion ton oil equivalent natural gas will be extracted from the seabed. So that gives another dimension to our talk. We talk about the value of shipping, we talk about the value of the extracting resources from the seabed, and now that adds another dimension. This region is going to be the this century's uh, contentious areas. Arctic Ocean, Eastern Mediterranean, South and East China Sea, Indian Ocean, West Africa, Thank God, Caspian Sea, they're going to handle, maybe you remember a couple days ago, they already signed an agreement for delimitation of the sea. 
This adds the potential Christ areas and other Christ areas because there are hydrocarbons in the areas that I mentioned. There are maritime claims, maritime delimitation claims between the nations. All these uh, points, white points, uh, indicates that the, there might be in the future uh, delimitation problems or ownership or sovereignty problems like Falklands, like Gibraltar, like Cyprus, of Turkey, for instance, or Egypt, and uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, and even Korea and Japan in the uh, Doko crisis. There are many. Even with Canada and United States and Matias Islands for lobsters, you know. <laughs> There are uh, delimitation problems everywhere. And whenever I lecture the, the young university students, I always say, go for the law of the sea. It's going to be the major issue in the next uh, decades. And you're going to be so, uh, let's say, occupied thinking about new ideas. And UNCLOS 3, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982. So interpretation of this convention and also the practices of the other cases that's going to be so important in, the, uh, in this century. Talking about this uh, limitation problems, all of the sea issues and shipping, uh, the world maritime order is dependent on these choke points. And the security and safety of these choke points are uh, vitally important for the growth of world economy and the smooth working of the world economy. If these choke points, one of them, is uh, choked <laughs> or is interrupted, the world uh, economic order disrupted very easily. And I really would like to talk a little bit about these major choke points. Hormones. 17 million barrels of oil passing through this strip. The world consumes 80 plus million barrels per day. So we are talking about 17 million barrels of oil every day. Crossing. And the narrowest point is 23 nautical miles. And in the question and answer period, if you ask me about the, you know, the potential uh, potentiality of the crisis in the Hormuz Strait, uh, we can talk about that. Uh, Malacca, vital for China. China consumes 12 million barrels per day. 12 million barrels per day. Half of which crosses Malacca Strait. And if this strait is closed, their economy becomes very fragile. And that's the one of the main reasons that China building one wall, one belt, one road uh, initiative in order to bypass the, or ease the vulnerabilities of the Malacca Strait. So the 1.7 nautical mile is a narrow point. And 15 million barrels of oil, as I told you, most of which goes to China and Japan. Japan is totally dependent on the oil coming from Middle East. Swiss Canal. Three million barrels of crude oil on daily move, but of which 2.6 million barrels transported by a cement pipeline. This pipeline, in fact, eases the tension or the heavy traffic over the Suez Canal. The ships go to uh, Mediterranean coast port, and this pipeline brings the oil coming from Middle East. From the Red Sea. Bab and Mender. You're going to hear, maybe you are already hearing the, those who are interested in the world political picture in, in Bab and Mender. Why? Uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, Saudi Arabia, after the, one of their very large crude carriers attacked by uh, Yemeni, uh, according to the Saudi claims, uh, Yemeni uh, Houthis and they banned all Saudi tankers crossing Bab and Mandem. But right now they ease this tension. Uh, this is important. Why? Every day, 3.8 or 4 million barrels are going through. And my place, 
I was born in some strength. So every day I see 25 uh, tankers carrying mainly Russian oil, 3 million, ba 3 million barrels per day, 150 million ton per year crossing from Turkish Straits towards the oceans of the world. And I will say almost 55% of Russian import and export traffic also other than oil crossing uh, Turkish Strait. So this strait is so vital, not only for Russia, for Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Georgia, and even Moldova. So uh, in Istanbul, 700 yards, the narrowest point, uh, in Çanakkale, 1,300 yards uh, in, the, in the narrowest point. This is expected to rise from 3 million barrels to 4 million barrels per day because of Kazakhstan Azeri oil is uh, added to the Caspian oil extraction. And after this Caspian uh, treaty signed uh, 10 days ago, uh, the production in the Caspian Sea will run. Panama Canal and Trans Panama Pipeline is also important. Uh, they are not carrying that much. I mean, only 1.85 million barrels U.S. origin crude oil uh, passes through the Panama. Uh, but important thing about Panama Canal: if it's closed, you have to have 8,000 nautical miles in order to reach Pacific Ocean or vice versa. Dam straits are important uh, because they connect the Baltic Sea to the North Sea. And uh, during World War One and World War Two, this Katega uh, or Danish Channel, Skajarek and Uresong was so strategically important and they laid mines and mines and they still <laughs> lay uh, clearing these mines. Thousands of mines are so strategic. And uh, Russian port Primorsk, also another oil uh, carrying or oil uh, exporting port. 42% uh, of the uh, traffic comes from this tanker traffic because of Russian export oil, Lighten, Black Sea, Novorossiysk, and Turkish Straits. Cape of Gudo, another choke point, uh, 5 million barrels we see every day. And other important series, uh, as I said, as we see Gulf of Guinea and Niger Delta. And uh, in Niger Delta, we see every day a trillion barrels movement of oil. And state of Gibraltar, another important choke point, although Mediterranean is a very small sea, only 1% of the world oceans, but carries more than 15% or 20% of the world uh, maritime shipping because of uh, many developed countries coastlines there. And Sicilian Strait again between the Central Mediterranean and Eastern Mediterranean important. Let me talk about Northwestern Passage. Uh, you know, uh, if you have seen the, uh, I think HBO, HMS Terror, uh, the serial, TV serial, it talks about this uh, Northwest Passage endeavor of the uh, British Navy that they failed. Uh, if they endeavor this time, of course they will be successful. Uh, that is a breakthrough in the world shipping industry right now. Maybe you, some of them, some of you might have heard that uh, one and a half year ago, a Carnival Cruise Line made this passage on board, 2,000 passengers, first time ever, they used the Northwest Passage, as you see, from Atlantic Ocean to Pacific. Why? Because of unfortunate thing for humanity, and I think it's most dangerous thing, the ice melting. That will change all the world climate order. We are talking about the economic order, or defense order, or security order, but the overarching important thing is coming like an avalanche, which is environmental meltdown or uh, ice meltdown and environmental catastrophes. This is important. Maybe it might be good for the industry because it will create such a short distances and it will, uh, it will in the future uh, cost reductions maybe 20%, 25%, but uh, on the other hand, 
uh, the world climate stability and balance will change. You see, in the right hand side, from Seattle to Rotterdam, 2,000 nautical miles sailing. It's a huge sailing instead of 9,000 nautical miles from the uh, Seattle to Rotterdam coast. And in the future, that would help China as well. We are talking about from Europe to China via the Northwest Passage. They will help them to maybe save more than $120 billion a year in terms of shipping costs. And so in the Arctic, we see China as a major player. So as I told you, it's going to end up with 20% savings. Northwest Passage. Let's talk about One Belt, One Road project. Uh, this is very important. Over extent to western and southern axis, One Belt, One Road. One Road signifies the Silk Road, which is maritime. One Belt signifies the land and railroads, which is uh, north of, uh, sorry, westbound, but north of China as you see on the map. Why it is important? Because Odor takes its basis from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And therefore, uh, China first established the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a geopolitical firm base, and then come up with an <coughs> economic initiative, but in fact has geopolitical implications, because because of not only the land and rail and pipeline roads, but maritime roads. And last uh, six months ago, they, January 2018, sorry, uh, five, uh, yeah, seven months ago, they issued white paper on the Arctic, and they said, Obor, one belt, one road, will include the Arctic, Arctic routes or courses in the future. So, let's think about this choke point, this shipping order right now, working like a Swiss clock. Everything's perfect. Why? During the Pax Britannica, started, let's say, after the Trafalgar, until maybe the Suez problem of 1956, or maybe the end of World War II, it differs. Uh, it was Pax Britannica. They provide the smooth working of the world maritime ship, controlling choke points, controlling major ports, and volunteer, let's say, uh, policy of the oceans in order to provide safe and sound navigation. After the Trafalgar, maybe for 100 years, there was no wars. During that period of time, what the Royal Navy did, they made charts, they made astronomical calculation tables, they created many, let's say, navigational benefits. Can you imagine, they went to the South Ocean, below the 40 degrees south latitudes, in order to study the currents, in order to study the Antarctic. So, they provided until the end of the World War II, some sort of a working uh, maritime environment. And that job handed over to the United States after the World War II. And right now, the United States is providing this, let's say, free for all nations, working order of the oceans, which is, of course, good for the America. Think about this system is impaired, or this system is Interrupted. One of these choke points or cut. And disruption in maritime shipping network can cause avalanche effects. What might be wars, terror attacks, piracy, natural disasters, strikes, like, you know, right now we are talking about the ice map now, but on the other hand, I didn't mention because of time constraints, the flooding. 
according to every major force. There are 12, there are 12 big cities a population over than 15 million in the world. 13 of them are seaside. Can you imagine the effects of the flood in the meltdown of global warming consumers? So look at this slide. Two million barrel of oil in 1958, Suez Crisis. Six day war, two million, which means that the destruction of the uh, supply. Arab oil embargo, 4.3 million. Iranian revolution, 5.6. Iran Iraq, 4.1. Kuwait invasion, 4.3. Iraq export suspension, 2.1. Venezuelan strike 2.6, war in Iraq, second war 2.3, Katrina retaliates 1.5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but because of the reservoir, 65 persons are still there. You know, Suez Canal was closed after the Six Day War, and tanker traffic was reverted to Cape of Kuto, and they added additional six thousand nautical miles. So many firms are bankrupt. Uh, Iran Iraq war, you remember, eight years from 1980, 240 tankers were attacked by Iraqis and Iranians. Can you imagine? Both are fighting each other and they're both attacking the tankers. Fifty-five tankers, including many Turkish tankers, were sunk or heavily damaged. Traffic was decreased up to 25%, and insurance costs and oil prices as they would all increased. This is a terror attack, 6 October 2002, against a French tanker Limbo, Al-Qaeda. 400 barrels of oil she was carrying, 9,000 barrels of oil dispersed <coughs> to the sea. Environmental disaster was created. It created the $4 million monthly revenue for poor Yemeni government. They were so poor. 3,000 Yemenis lost their jobs. Insurance costs, shipping their trip. You know, a single attack, a half the size, not a big show. In 2008, we, faced, we were faced with piracy attacks, you know. Yes, there were piracies in everywhere in the world, but not a major scale. But 2008, in Somalia, of course, and Gulf of Aden. Look at this ship. She was carrying Saudi ship, two million barrels of crude oil. Two million. Almost OPEX one day reserve. One day reserve. This, this, that is a super tank. The world maritime industry has, like this ship, almost 350 or 400. The value of the tanker with cargo was $256 million. Biggest ship ever hijacked in the maritime shipping history. And as I recall, that ship was hijacked almost 400 nautical miles away the shore with very small pirate vessels. You can see the asymmetry. That pirate skiff or boat is costing maximum $15,000. You see the uh, asymmetric effect on the energy security or shipping security. So we, we will say the security of maritime shipping affects all global economic order because it, it can disrupt the, world, the daily movements of oil, daily movements of grain as well. I didn't talk about the detail about the grain, but most of the nations are dependent on the grains exported from the grain-rich countries like Africa. So if this grain traffic was interrupted, it's sure that most of the nation's people will die of hunger. So, Security of world coastlines adjacent to major sea lines of communication necessitate the stain, stain of maritime security. If you ask me, what is the major uh, security concern for the future, I will say sustainment of maritime security. 
I'm forgetting the uh, geopolitical, let's say, tug of war uh, between the powers. Because it's different domain, but security is important. Post 11 September period, in fact, helped a great deal to establish and to develop a world maritime security system. That was a revolution because that time I was captain and then once I admiral, I served in the in Turkish Navy Police Department and I went to IMO and I went to NATO and we established as Turkey in the Black Sea many maritime security initiatives unilaterally and then they became, it became multilateral between Russia, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, Romania and Bulgaria and therefore I remember those days very uh, freshly and maybe if you have any of you has both AIS, Automatic Identification System, is the product of post 11 September. Right now from my cellular phone, I can go on my phone and I can go to the picture of AIS in any place in the world and I can show you in, for instance, that tanker is going through the New Orleans right now. Everything. I mean, the crew list, the departure port, estimated time of arrival, the next port of call, anything you can imagine, thanks to that period. Right now, like the aviation industry, they have the overall air picture. Right now, the maritime industry has the picture, but by 11 September 2001, there was no such a picture. So, the main issue after the 11th September was deter and destroy. And maritime security operations conducted in different maritime regions of the globe that time were essential. Still, these operations are continuing, but with lesser, let's say, importance, because already the system is established. They call it maritime domain awareness. Right now, the world, everybody, China, Russia, United States, any nation, you name it, they have the maritime domain awareness. Every nation right now is, not, other than, of course, the, uh, some nations like African nations without any uh, proper infrastructure, but uh, some nations are helping them to establish their system. Why I'm stressing on this issue so much? Because no state or alliance has reach and capability to establish and maintain maritime security alone. So the world needs uh, maritime brotherhood or maritime uh, alliances, uh, connectivity, uh, apart from the geopolitical strife. And therefore, the international cooperation and coordination in this regard is so essential. Keeping the sea lines of communications and important choke points open, safe, and secure, I think is the uh, number one task of humanity and essential necessity, again, leaving geopolitical competitions aside. <clears throat> Once sea lines of communications and choke points become insecure and unsafe, the effects of sky consequences can transcend far beyond geopolitical and political competition with no winner behind. Everybody knows. Trade doesn't go insecure and unsafe areas. So therefore regional cooperation and therefore a global partnership of regionally provided securities, this is my term, is I think essential. Every coastal nation with their neighbors should establish uh, some sort of a global, uh, sorry, regional security system. That system should be interconnected or integrated to the global partnership of uh, maritime security. And that makes world oceans and seas secure and safe for everybody and deter, of course, those conducting illegal activities at sea. For instance, this drug trafficking coming from Caribbean islands, ICGTF, in inter, uh, interstate uh, joint task force, United States Navy, some European navies, including Dutch and British Navy. You know, they established this task force and that task force was a major deterrent uh, after 1990s uh, for these drugs coming from the uh, Caribbean Sea uh, towards United States coast. 
like Turkey did in the Black Sea Forum, Black Sea and Naval Cooperation Task Group, including six littoral states, to establish some sort of a, a maritime confidence and security building tool, which were perfectly. And therefore, I think every uh, choke point area or strategically important area should establish that, that small portions of maritime security operations. Again, once lost, we cannot take it, take it for granted. It takes long and difficult process to restore and maintain. So, outlook, I would say, depending on natural change in Arctic region, as well as economic, political, security developments in Eastern Mediterranean, Persian Gulf, South and East China Sea, and Niger Delta, respectively, will add new centers of gravity to the existing security risks and threats to maritime trade, energy, and food securities, as well as freedom navigation. This is the fact of life that we are seeing every day. You know, one of the Turkish warships was attacked uh, in the in offshore of Bab el Mandeb by uh, Yemeni uh, coastline with a uh, missile. Thank God there was no loss of life, but it happens. Uh, or or Niger Delta, every week we see uh, kidnapping or hijacking because of Niger Delta pirate, let's say, uh, activities. Still, uh, we see those kind of activities. And cooperation and coordination efforts of states in maritime security, again, immune from geopolitical and political tug of war through uniting power of the seas, which have no physical borders, doubtlessly shall contribute to the energy security and welfare of mankind. He let me give you an example. For instance, in 2009, when the piracy attacks in the Gulf of Aden and Somali coast was so high, uh, India, China, Russia sent warships. And all these warships work perfectly well with the NATO ships. And with CTF-150, which is under the command of the United States Navy, they made weekly coordination meetings that, that I know because that time I was in active duty. That, that was the maybe uh, most solid example of the uniting power of the sea. Because everybody knew that the, uh, if this ship or the uh, line of uh, sea lines of communication is interrupted, everybody will lose. China will lose, Russia will lose, India will lose, everybody. So I think I stop here and take your questions if you have any. Thank you very much for your <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, I have a twofold uh, question. Uh, are there uh, uh, any future ideas of uh, creating uh, waterways that will help the transportation of the goods and so services. I think I mentioned the you know, Northwest Passage, but... Uh, you mean new waterways? Yes, like in pa Panama Canal, I, I, I don't know. Oh, yes, is. yeah, the man-made, yes. Have you ever heard Kra, Kra, K-R-A, Kra channel, no. in the Thailand Peninsula? China, is Thailand, is negotiating for this channel, for Kra channel. Uh -huh. Why? Let me find the... Uh, just a moment, let me find the uh, uh, first Like Kibada in Pakistan, for instance, uh, 
China Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, they call it. Another bypass. Another bypass because from the uh, Suez Canal, Bab el Mandeb, or Hormuz, directly coming to the Arabian Sea, to the west of the Pakistani uh, port of Gwadar, pipelines, railroads, and uh, other roads directly going to the China. So, another bypass of Malacca State. I told you, Malacca is the Achilles heel for uh, China. They know where I'm going. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Chinese militarization is Bradley seems to be an egregious case of, uh, you know, exerting power far offshore, uh, affecting basically every country in the Far East. And I don't see any effective response to, you know, the fact on the ground. Yeah, this is a geopolitical domain. Uh, I would like to give you an objective answer. What Maha? Do you know Admiral Maha? Alfred yeah. A. Maha. You know, what was the most fortunate moment for U.S. history in the uh, 19th century, I think, meeting Mahan with Roosevelt. Mahan gave the idea to Roosevelt for maritime supremacy. Without Mahan and Roosevelt together, we wouldn't be talking about the U.S. Navy's uh, you know, grandiosity of today. I think China is doing what they've seen what the United States did in 19th century in their geopolitical world. Everybody knows, Everybody knows that the, what they are doing in the South China Sea, according to the UNCLOS, United Nations Convention of the World to Sea, is not fair. And International Court of Arbitration's decision of uh, 17 July 2014, no, 2016, you know, totally ruled that China is on the wrong side. But in geopolitical terms, who has the power, who has the you know, uh, jurisdiction? I met many Chinese officials, not officials, scholars. Uh, they, you know, explain with their version of legal, let's say, uh, justifications like traditional views or historical, uh, let's say, past, like, because the law of the sea likes historical past. They said that these islands, they call it nine dash line, these islands and this delta deserve no, 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 man's, no man's land, but they, they used the uh, centuries by the Chinese fishery, basically. But right now, uh, I told you about the importance of the Malacca Strait. China is acting with geopolitical difference. And my personal idea is unavoidable. If you enlarge economically, you act geopolitically. This is exactly what the United States has done after 1890, when you surpass in terms of production of England. And you fought against England, 1812 war, right? So I think China is replicating or is repeating the history <coughs> for her inner geopolitical uh, area, first final chain and second type of change. And for a large, huge economy, it is expected, I would say. Okay. Yes, sir. You mentioned the importance of the Turkish Strait to Russian maritime. Yeah. Could you speak to the maritime strategic importance of the reported drift of Turkish policy away from the US toward Russia under President Erdogan? Turkish-American relations in the last uh, 70 years has ups and downs. If you remember 1970s, in single night, Turkey closed more than 15 U.S. bases because of this uh, hashish, uh, you know, agricultural thing. Of, 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 you remember that. And uh, 
As you'll recall, again, in 1974, when the Turkey intervened, Cyprus, uh, Turkey uh, had an embargo until 1978. Turkish Air Force didn't have the tires from the United States, so the Turkish Air Force couldn't fly. So, there are some. So I think uh, 15 July, aborted coup, uh, unfortunately dictated and orchestrated by a uh, Gulenist movement, uh, was affected too much. Not only the current government, any government in any nation can be offended uh, by a coup supported by a leader residing in Pennsylvania. Nobody can accept such a thing. I personally would not. I mean, so there is no justification for this. Because first time ever in our history, this organization inf infiltrated to Turkish armed forces, used firepower against Turkish nation. This is unexcusable. And therefore, any government, forget Erdogan, any government under these circumstances had two options. First, accept the coup, accept the, this Gulenist web of infiltration everywhere, not only the armed forces, judicial, police, anything you name, even the business, or fight against it. Because don't forget. Turkey is a very peculiar country from three different perspectives. First, Turks established states in history. This is the 16 Turkish states. And Turkish written history is about 4,000 years old. Second, I'm not talking about the Ottoman Empire because only 600 years we are talking. Of Turks' history, thousands of years. Second, Turks produced Kemal Ataturk. Still, he is unbeatable, he is invictus. He died in 1938, but there is no any nation in the world had a leader living in the hearts and minds of the population. In Turkey, whenever you go, you can see the other Turks pictures everywhere. And yes, the governments in the previous and current times, there are some people to eradicate the effects of the other Turks, yes, we know it, but it's impossible. And therefore, one of the major national power instruments of Turkey other than military, political, psychological, etc. Alone, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. He is singly an uh, instrument of power. And everybody, because if this coup was abortive or uh, evaded, avoided, thanks to those Kemalist officers still working in the armed forces, they didn't let, they fought against the Islamist generals and officers. I know many of them. And the Turk, Turk, important factor. Turks in their history never been rescued by other nations. Our constitution never been written by other nations. And when we fought in world, after World War I, nobody came to assist Turkey against you know, Greek invasion or already uh, invading powers of France, Italy, Kingdom. Turks fought them alone. And these three factors make Turkey a peculiar country. And during this great school, I think, uh, including your government, including ma many NATO governments, didn't take this into consideration. So my answer, this is temporary. If United States is willing to, let's say, provide a sound and safe world economy security order, bringing peace to everybody, I think should gain Turkey back again. Uh, because uh, I think the nations of United States and Turkey uh, look alike. 
Do you know how many people from Syria as refugees are residing in Turkey? 3.5 million. One month ago in Germany, Merkel governments almost toppled down because of their expecting 15,000 refugees. So which means that Turkey is an open-hearted, good people's land, ex accepting everybody, like the United States during the World War II, during the World War I did the same thing. And in terms of psychological, let's say, uh, similarity, I will say US people looks like Turkish people. Yes, sir. You, uh, another choke point which uh, you didn't mention is, uh, is, China, is China still working with Nicaragua to do a, uh, a cut through uh, along the uh, Lake Managua and through there to, in effect, supersede the Panama Canal? I know we can't do that. Part of our, our treaty with Panama is that we forswore developing any competing <laughs> Now, yes. but is China still trying to do something in Nicaragua? I, I'm not aware of that, sir. I'm sorry. Because one belt, one road covers Mediterranean Sea, covers uh, some portion of the Western Pacific. If they have, I don't know. I, my, this is my fault. But what I know, in the uh, last year, they included the Latin America countries in the one belt, one road scheme. This is what I know. But I'm not aware of, I didn't read anything about the Nicaraguan so. Yes? Um, as a nation, does Turkey, uh, the people of Turkey, do they have uh, any favorite Western leader that uh, they look up to and say now that he's running? Western world <laughs> for for today or for uh, for the history? No, no, going back in history. Yes, I will say after having Atatürk, no Turks right now will say anybody else after Atatürk. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't say no, after producing or having the Atatürk, I will say no Turk right now would envy any other leader because we have the Atatürk. Atatürk is is the number one leader according to many stories because he changed everything. Can you imagine? Ottoman Empire missed the Industrial Revolution, Reform and Renaissance. Yes, that was an empire, but when it collapsed, it was a backward, almost medieval age empire. Uncomparable to that time, England or France or United States. Tell you what. When the new republic was established in 1923, there were 500 electric motors only in overall Ottoman territory. Can you imagine? And the literacy level was five percent. We are talking about the but Atatürk made this society from 1923 till 1938, one of the most developed economy, in the most sorry, fastest growing economy, paying all the debts of the Ottoman Empire and making a very vivid, very dynamic society in every aspect. And most importantly, he created a secular republic of 600 Muslim theocracies. This is a unique and most important added value to the mankind. And therefore, I will say, uh, Kemal Atatürk, but still for many terms, is primus inter pares. Thank you. You agree? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I find it a bit uh, contradictory uh, to say that Atatürk, which of course he is, he is greater than. But then again, Erdogan is is totally the opposite of Atatürk in terms of Atatürk was very secular, he changed everything, and Erdogan is going back to, you know, more conservative, religious, and as much as Atatürk was popular, Erdogan seems to be very popular too. So how does that work? Okay, <laughs> very, very easy answer to you. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever heard the name Abdul Hamid II as yes. Sultan between 1876 
until 1909, 33 years. Total dictatorship, total police state. And everybody, because I read a lot of memoirs of that era, especially Admiral Daniel Lawson's memoirs, because number one victim of that era was the Navy. He jailed the Navy in the Golden War. And Navy didn't move because he was so afraid of the Navy to be toppled down by the Navy because his uncle was toppled down by the Navy. So he ruled 33 years. He banned everything related to it. Even the Encyclopedia Britannica was banned. Why? Because in the dictionary section there was a word named Republic. The naval officer brought that encyclopedia was exiled to Provesa, Greece. I read his memoirs too. He was so upset. Okay? But what about, we are talking about 1909, 14 years later, we fought, after 1909, sorry, we fought Libya War, Balkan War, World War I, and Struggle War, National Independence War. Within this 14 years of time, and we established a brand new republic. So which means Turkish sociogenetical codes are so dynamic. So dynamic. It changed. Nobody could have imagined after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, a new republic after the signing of the sales agreements, maybe in 1920. Three years later, a new republic was established. But look at Germany, their empire collapsed and there was no fight by Germans against the winners. In Austria-Hungria, they collapsed, they dismantled, and there was no war again. But Turks, they didn't accept it. They fought back, which indicates Turkish people are different. In 1960, for example, sorry, 1950, after Camarota Turks, uh, and 12 years after this uh, loss, a new party was established, Democrat Party, right? Uh, who established this party? Conservatives, liberals, coming from farming, big farming families. And they, they lost, uh, sorry, they won the elections in 1950. Until 1960, for 10 years, they rule Turkey, just like today's government. Totally. They, they made the Ezan, you know, the Turkish praise, was in Arabic, Atatürk made it Turkish. First thing they did, made it Arabic again. Okay, they opened the, the Islamic scholar school. But in 1960, there was a coup. Again, yes, ups and downs. And I read a lot about the people's uh, impressions about Turkey coming recently to Turkey. One of the most striking one I read a couple uh, couple days ago in an internet. It said that uh, I can explain Turkey with uh, three words: good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> the good, it said. Nice people, friendly people. They are so fond of people, children. They are fond of helping uh, foreigners and you can feel yourself as a foreigner in this country. The people, their food is excellent, you know. Their, their beaches, their coast and their natural... How about the bad thing? The bad thing, it says that they, they are polarized. Yes, of course. But polarization, I see in your country too. Mm. Pro-Trump, anti-Trump, okay. Every country right now, because I think this is the maybe the result of uh, neoliberal system after 1970. They encourage, they promote the consumption, not the production. And unfortunately, they force the people to look at television screen, right now the iPads and iPhones, <laughs> and people do not talk, people do not share, people do not enjoy the same principles or values, and they are easily polarized. This is what we are seeing in Turkey, and we are seeing in here, we are seeing in France, we are seeing everywhere. So, if I sum up, I will say the bad thing the guy said about this polarization, very nice observation, but I am sure that polarization could not go far beyond 
because of our, uh, again, sociogenetic traditions and codes. Turks didn't fight each other. You fought only once in 1861 and 1865. We fought only once during the National Independence War because British people. Uh, look at right now. Yes, we have a war with our you know, Kurdish uh, people, but we call it PKK because there is nothing wrong with our Kurdish minority. We are very uh, happy. In, in our Navy, there were many Kurdish background admirals, officers, ship commanders. But uh, right now, this polarization, not secular, not secular, but Kurds, anti Kurds, still going on, but that will not end up with breakup of a major, let's say, civil war. And therefore, let's come to the ugly section. The buildings, he says. <laughs> <laughs> they build ugly buildings. <laughs> and I agree, yes. I, I think uh, our time is... Oh, oh. Rogers Memorial Library oh. back, which will be in Turkey with you, <laughs> and a little tiny little present. And for a final thought, every year there will be an anniversary, right? So we'd like to have you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for